Hey everyone, Ariel Adams here. I'm here with John Diggs again. Welcome to another Hour Time Experiments. How's it going, John? Oh, surviving, surviving. We should tell the people where we were. Where were we? We were gone. We were? (laughs) I've never left the comfort of my own confining office. I I I, t- I told I told everybody ask Ariel why we're not doing why we're not doing the the show and why weren't we doing the show I uh, I hate cooperation You do hate cooperation Yeah I'm You're the most uncooperative. uncooperative person I thrive yeah. on a on, on a lack of cooperation <laughs> That's my MO Anyway welcome back to the Hour Time podcast We're going to try to do these once a week God help us Um so so we had a little adventure today. Everybody was really excited about something I wrote today. Yeah. Uh, the problem with watch payola. You know, you know what I love about you? You get really passionate about something and then you write about it. And then I have to find out like after the fact, like everyone, John is probably the most impulsive person I know, which has good and bad qualities to it for sure. For what, sure. So wait, so wait, what am I supposed to, how am I supposed to be not, how would, how would I do this better to, to make you feel better. I don't understand what well, the situation is. Well, here's the thing. You, you write an article about arguably a very important topic, and you agree that it's an important topic, and the idea is, uh, I think the bigger topic is transparency in media as related to the watch lover experience. Now, transparency! You know that I deal with this more on a day-to-day basis, right? Yeah. And so you see things from your perspective that I clearly don't see, but at the same time, it would have been good for you to just ask me, like, what's up with this? Well, okay, so hold on a second. So so what I wrote about, very specifically, this was very specifically what I wrote, and it has nothing to do with you, and I don't even, I don't care, and you're going to explain your situation as well. Uh, what I wrote about very specifically was that a company came to me a little while ago, or a couple days ago, and they said, and they said, hey, we wanted to buy a watch review from you. And I'm like, what? Buy who? Buy a, who? Who sells watch reviews? And they said, oh, well, Warren and Wound charges $2,500. Um, the, uh, whatchamacallit, everything, uh, whatchamacallit, they charge 2500 for their watch reviews. I'm right. Like, what? Who's the, who does that? Why would they, why are they charging? Because these are Kickstarter watches. So, I mean, absolutely. I, I completely agree that Kickstarter watches, the vast majority of them are garbage. Sorry. Yeah. I'm, that's, the, that's, the vast that's, majority that's, are. The vast majority are garbage. I will take advertising from guys who I think have have something going for them. If it's if it's not a three hander and it's not some janky stuff, if they're if they're friendly, if they're if they're nice people, I will do it. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna write about it unless it's something special. And 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 we've done that. We've done pretty consistently. I've tried to write about. I wrote about Butler. Um, they've been they've been nice to us and they've they've they actually have a story behind them. Butler, et cetera, et cetera. Butler, the J80, a handsome watch, handsome, handsome. Um, but this guy, but Warren and Wound for them to charge $2,500 to get a Kickstarter post up is just ridiculous. It's completely ridiculous. I didn't, I didn't know this actually until you wrote about it. Now here's the thing. Um, okay. you, you kind of, if I were at Warren and Wound, I'd feel a little embarrassed because this is not cool what they're doing. I agree. But you kind of single them out, right? Like yeah. there's been years have gone by already where we have received, um, messages from all kinds of brands asking us how much it costs for a review. And th- usually those are brands that we wouldn't write about normally. And so I either ignore it or just say things like we don't receive money for reviews because this has been going on a long time. Warren and Wound did not invent this practice. Yeah, I know. You know, and if anything, their way of doing it is not necessarily like as bad. My concern and where I agree with you is that if you go to their site, these so-called sponsored reviews are not very well identified. And so for me, I think that there's nothing wrong with, I'll call them creative ways of making money as an online publisher, because you can't make money the traditional way. You have to be creative, but you have to remove confusion. If the pe- person reading it doesn't know where the, the source uh-huh. of the message come fr- comes from, then you're trying to deceive them. Then they get skeptical, and then they have every right to no and longer I'm take gonna, their, and I'm gonna, their publication I'm gonna, seriously. I'm going to call you out here, Ariel. Okay. I think, but I'm, but I, but I, I would also argue that you did a fairly good job of explaining what the heck's going on. The the CGR Airspeed, which we wrote about, I believe, uh, is a pretty cool watch. Uh-huh. Looking, it's a pretty cool looking watch. It's clever. Whatever. We, let's 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 not let's not get into semantics. Uh, it's a but you got a sponsored post here, and you got paid. You got paid a certain amount of money, right? Yeah. And so. So for our sponsor post, we have a very, um, a very specific kind of requirement, 
And we created sponsored posts a while ago specifically because smaller brands um, could not generally afford um, our normal advertising costs for display advertising. So I said, we need to have an option that, that a smaller brand, a startup brand can afford. What we learned was that it was a very interesting opportunity for brands to tell messages um, in in sort of a unique unique so, way. So tell so an, answer me this, riddle me this. So the and uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna bust your balls here because this is a big deal. Uh, so the the at the heart of the CGR airspeed is the automatic Miyota 80, 8219. Who who wrote that? Apparently, okay. Miyota's workhorses have been go to lay micro brands across. Every the board. single sponsored post that we do, our requirement is it's written by the advertiser. We so never write that. So some so but this is written in the way that like we write on involved. there that it was written by the yeah. advertiser for this. I don't want anyone to confuse their voice with our voice. I don't know their product like they their product. They like they know it, right? So if we write if about you, their product and we co- sort of try to sound all enthusiastic about it, we don't know their product. Plus it would be artificial for us to sound enthusiastic about something we don't know about. If the brand says we are confident enough in our product to advertise it. I want to give them the space to send a direct message to a potential consumer. But look, they say the, the case has a seamless pebble-like shape that while reminiscent of the Resens Type 5 has an overall different feel. It's all, it seems really, it seems like, it seems like your voice to a degree. But it's which not. Is kinda, we which had nothing I know it's to not do your voice. It. Yeah, it's not, it's not, this isn't, this isn't my favorite either. And I need. I know you need the money, but let's but let's rethink this. What would you do differently? I mean, it's it's written several times on the post that it's sponsored, and that's not us. Yeah, I know, but we I wouldn't. Were, I wouldn't, I wouldn't the... run a post like this. I wouldn't run a post like this. Imagine replace replace uh, replace this watch with with Scientology, you... and then use the and then use the same language. At the heart of Scientology is is uh, is L. Ron Hubbard, and he is an amazing man. L. Ron Hubbard is, brings brought millions of people together under one amazing roof. I mean, it sounds like you're trying to compare that watch to Scientology. Like <laughs> we don't we don't allow all sponsored posts. Like we get people who want to buy them all the time that we say no to. We only allow those that we think would be even re- remotely interested, interesting to our audience. And the problem is this. Like a lot of these Kickstarter projects, and again, a lo- not all of our sponsored posts are about Kickstarter projects. just happens to be a lot of them are. We have auction houses that do them. We have stores that have events that do them. There's all kinds of stuff. It's not just this. Um, but what you need to understand is that we we really get at, get rid of a lot of the chaff. There's a lot of like just... Nonsense well, I I'm, I'm, I'm that we just say I'm no to. I'm positive that you that you do that you do a good job of picking out the good stuff. We, we listen. We try oh, our I, best, and no I, one I, has ever said, you, you know, you who wrote this decade. So that's not a problem. I'm not. I'm not concerned about that. Um. Um. <clears throat> so so I'm I'm looking at the I'm looking at the uh, the ad the ads that you have on your site, and you have you have a lot of Casio ads, right? So I I, I just turn off ad block, so I actually can see them now. Yeah, and listen, you know, we just did a test, actually, because I was curious what percentage of our audience uh, comes to site using an ad blocker. Because as far as I'm concerned, I hate annoying ads. I really do. And we don't have annoying ads. We don't have pop-ups. We don't have interst- uh, interstitials that, like, stop you along the way. We don't have, like, things that make noise. Like, I don't allow any of those types of ads. And so for us, I never understand why someone is, a, 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 like, an ad blocker because they're in no way intrusive. And you learn interesting stuff. I mean... At its heart, advertising is totally okay. Someone feels confident enough in a product to spend money to get it in front of your eyes because they think you might be a, a, a consumer, that you might be interested. So, in that purest sense, I believe in advertising. Yeah. It's just that it's become so annoying online that the bad um, is really casting a terrible, terrible light yeah. on an industry that at its heart is good. So look at look at look at Rust Watch Review, and I, I I hate I hate our I hate our theme now. I mean, you have and, a you have a lot more ads than we do. I'll play I that really way. do, but you'll notice it's like Ben Ross. Well, no, Ben Ross is a giveaway. Uh, we got a very or whatever. We got Butler up there who who I like, but they're still paying for they're still paying for an ad. We are got we having an ad off? We're, we are having an ad off because I because we got I, I gave Crown and Caliber an ad. Steverell has an ad. Some other garbage here. A lot of Amazon stuff because I because I've never monetized this site. You understand this? Yeah, I've, and I've had I, to do that because we have a bunch of people. We have yeah, to pay. you really have. You really have. And I and I, I appreciate I appreciate your pain, uh, completely. 
But and I, I'm also doing this ginormous banner ad at the top that people are buying, and people we're we're selling this we're selling this ginormous banner ad out. And I'm well. and, I, and honestly, it makes me happy to know that you're able to sell it. I want watch advertisers to spend more money on watch websites because there's an ROI for them. So I'm trying so hard to increase the value. Um, for everyone involved, and, and that means having a good environment with good articles, with things that make sense, where people aren't deceived, where people yeah. aren't confused, See, where the I editorial would, is real and natural, and not you know. I would I would completely you know I, I would I would I would full bore if I if I if I were a crueler person I would full bore call everybody out for this sponsored post garbage. But and the thi- here's the thing: you have to understand. At the end of the day, you know. Zach and this team at Warren and Wound, they're among the few people trying to create a business out of this. Um, you know, no, no one's perfect. I'm not saying that those guys are like, uh, you know, the best operation in the world. They're trying various techniques. They try to sell stuff. They try to do these things. Um, you know, casting them in the, in the most positive light possible, they're experimenting and they're making some mistakes along the route, on the, along the road, right? But yeah. they're by no means the worst offenders. I think that in their mind, what they're doing is like, uh, you know, medium bad at the worst compared to some of the other guys. Because there's some other outfits that are entirely pay for play. Yeah, we can we can go we can go. Oh yeah, I know that much. Okay, we can go all we can go all the way down though. We can all go all the way down the rat hole if we want. I understand that completely. Uh See, it, it, it shouldn't be pay for play. And, and I fought, I fought tooth and nail for the past. I, I've been doing this garbage for, I've been doing this garbage for 16 years. So you're talking about the tech industry, right? The tech industry. I, I fought okay. tooth and nail for us not to do this. Anymore. And how, and let me ask you this. And again, I support that. But in the long time you've done this over a decade, what has been the result of your fight? The result of the fight has been a small group of of freedom fighters who believe in in the idea, who believe in that advertising is advertising, editorial is editorial, and there's a there's a wall between them. And then there's also the rest of the world who is actively putting a bunch of garbage on there. Now the other thing that this does, and you, and nobody understands this. No, this is exactly what happened by putting up by putting up sponsored posts. You you guys. Have very specifically spread and I'm and okay. So I'm, and I've 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 done I've done one sponsored post on on wristwatch review. I forget where it was, uh, but I just I was I just wanted to give it a try. We could, we have created a uh, an island of cynicism. A crea- we've created cynicism in the reader who who looks at this thing and says, "Oh, this is sponsored." We we we've, we had it with we had it with Apple. We had it with Samsung and everything on on TechCrunch and Gizmodo. If you posted anything about a about a big company, they'd say you got paid by Apple. If I got paid by Apple, I'd be in a goddamn helicopter right now, flying around <laughs> instead of talking to you guys on a podcast. I assure you of that. Um, so so you guys can you guys can sit and spin. Nobody gets but but the cynicism that's created turns the entire media industry into the thing where people say, hey, why not? Why don't we just do this thing? Why don't we just go nuts? Why don't we just sell all our adver- advertorial? And the watch magazines historically had done that for for decades, and they basically sold the covers. They sold all the BS. It was a really messy industry, and it's still a messy industry. And I would love it. I would love to solve, make, make, figure out a way to to escape it. This is the way. I know. I know the way. And again, as as noble as your fight has been so far, it's doomed because the people against you are more than the people for you. I believe that in the future things will change, and this would ha- has to happen. We're not there yet. And this actually ties in to the startup you're working on about having what I'll call frictionless transactions. Yeah, yeah. I believe that the future is in consumers paying for content. Okay, yeah, if you exactly. change the dynamic where a blog to watch and other publications, they are paid by their audience, they will work for their audience, they will not work for the advertiser. You got to chase where the money is because without the money, show's over, everyone. We're not a philanthropy as much as we want to be. We yeah, can't. Here, look, cl- uh, go over to this. Uh, where's the where's the link? Uh, Where do you want me to go? I'm gonna I'm gonna send you over to a thing. You guys can read it. It's on it's on TechCrunch, and I wrote about it. Okay, if so you, if, so if, that if, needs if you, that needs to happen. Now here's the if problem. If you scroll down, I wrote here. How about you pay? Here's the biggest problem. You get your clickbait for free. I'd point to free to play games, an excellent corollary to this point. We see this a pernicious of free in a very real way. They are games, to be sure, and in different contexts, it would be acceptable ways to pass the time. Because their creators are counting on big money, they have to lead you down pathways of addiction in order to force you to pay $69 for a bucket of rubies or $199 for a better gun. You pay for rubies.
be because the game is free. The fact that children or even adults would pay this amount to power up is true clickbait. Journalists don't think in terms of clickbait, at least not any I know and respect, but we do like their jobs. The, f the, fate of, the fall of small town paper has led to a gutting of the industry. Not all of the urban hubs have any entry-level positions, if they have a news media at all. Gone are the days of working your way up from the Scranton Times Tribune and making big time in the globe-spanning, crown-shaking power of the LA Times. Uh, maybe the maybe this free-to-play games are the right idea. Maybe we just start charging for buckets of Taylor Swift posts. If you want acceptable media for free, you have to pay for it with your attention. If you want good media forever, you have to pay for it with your money. If you tell the news organization this, I'm sure they will be happy to let you pay in some way, either via microtransactions or a subscription. I would I would pay 25 cents a click for your site. I I seriously would. I'd put I'd put 100 bucks on a thing and I'd start I start clicking around the internet. And it's entirely feasible to do that right now with Bitcoin. Okay, with Bitcoin, right? Yeah. What we need to we need to back up a second and say, okay, we've established that the best type of media is the media that's paid for by the audience. Okay. The problem is 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 manifold. And I'd say one of the biggest problems is this. You either charge someone a, a ongoing subscription if they're regular, but if they're not, you allow people to piecemeal it by spending five, ten, twenty-five cents per an article. The problem is is right now we don't have uh, I'll call it a universal solution for the mainstream consumer where they can do those microtransactions and it makes sense because the, 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 the systems out there, the powers that be, charge too high of a of amount per transaction to make microtransactions worth it. Yes, Damn. you can do it in Bitcoin, yes. But we don't accept Bitcoin at this point. Most readers are not familiar with that. We would be dramatically reducing our ability to, to make money if we said, okay, you can only pay by Bitcoin. So something has to happen in the future as well as a cultural shift. If we just change everything now and we're able to implement a system where people have to pay for content, I feel that most people wouldn't do it because even if they won't be able to read our articles, there's pictures and nonsense out there that's made available for free. There's too yeah. much stuff out there which is free. So while there would be people that would appreciate yeah, yeah, yeah. paying for our content, there's too much other free crap out, out there you know, uh, just to see like a picture. And then they can say, well, if there's a review or something like that, I'll go on a blog to watch. But we essentially remove the majority of the people that like to just check our, our stuff out on a casual basis right now. And I still think that's cultural. I pay for media. I'm happy to do it. Online, I admit, when it comes to information, not that much, but I pay for The okay. Economist. I pay for a couple of other news exactly. apps and things like that. Like, I'm happy to do that. But I'm at a certain age where I have a little bit more, more money than I have time. Right. So I'm happy to pay for good quality media because I don't have time to just go everywhere. I see a lot of people just, you know, browsing Instagram or Snapchat or whatever. Like these people don't have a lot of money, but they have plenty of time to look at like animal videos online. And I think that there's been a culture of, you know, binging consumption when it comes to online media, which it's it's completely commitmentless. You don't have to pay anything. And people expect almost nothing intellectually. Um, but we are moving away from a society that knows how to find good information online versus bad information. We're not really sure how to do it, in my no. opinion. So I All agree right. with you. Anyway. I just don't think we're there yet. All right. So what's so what's so what's what's the bottom line? Ba the bottom we, line we, is we want, we want you guys <laughs> you guys to pay for this. I remember we we put up a Patreon, and I think I think we maxed out at like thirty bucks a month to do to do. Well, you know, uh, the problem was like, is, is again, I think that you. You went ahead and you did that, and we didn't really talk about it. We didn't have a plan behind it because we didn't have. Well, what kind of plan do we really need to have? Like, there's we we can't we can't sit here, we can't sit here and plan out every single thing because this stuff moves way too fast. That's the other thing. Um, I think we need. I I do think we need to plan. I think we need to put ourselves in the in the in the in the shoes of the consumer and say, okay, I'm being asked to pay for something. What do I get in exchange? And I think it has to be that because I listen, I don't support anything in the goodness of my heart. I don't just go and be like, I like these guys. I'm going to donate. No, 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 no. You offer me something. I consider your offer and I have to make a decision whether I want to accept that offer. And I don't think we made an, a valid enough offer to people to say, if you pay, this happens. Because even at the same time we did that, we started to record less episodes and things like that. It was a good l learning lesson for us, but I don't believe that it was... Um, an exercise in you know diligent planning because I think that if we ask people for money, we now have an obligation and responsibility to them to deliver something that they want on an ongoing basis, and we shouldn't commit ourselves to that unless we have a system in place. Was that nice and boring for you? Yeah, that does, that does make a lot of sense. We'll fi we'll figure it out later. Okay, uh, Cassio. <laughs> Cassio. Yay, Cassio! I'm yeah, going to visit their factory in September. I'm super excited. Are you take Are you taking a uh, a, a junket? 
I'm taking a junket. Junk it up. Junk I'm it up, ex- baby. I'm accepting Castillo's hospitality to Tokyo. It was funny. I had this idea that um, I tried to pitch by them that I think the U.S. team understood, but was like devilishly difficult for the, the Japanese team to to really wrap their minds around. And Okay, so you and I, we've been liking G-Shock watches for a while, right? Probably 20, 30 years? Yeah. And these have been become an integral part. I'm actually not looking at G-Shock right now. I'm looking at their, their uh, WSD F10, which is our Android-powered one. But let's just, let's go to... Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the site right now. I'm gonna find the. Um, well, I, I looked G-Shock. at the latest G-Shock. I went to the. I, I saw the latest G-Shock. It was really good. Uh, there's one from Basel that I liked a lot. Look at all these G-Shock. Okay, here we go. The, the GWF D1000. Okay, this is their. This is probably the most uh, impressive uh, Frogman today. It's over a thousand bucks. Super well made. Okay, now this design of this of this uh, 2016 frogman came from somewhere. And so I said to Cassio, I want to hang out with your designers to see what inspires them culturally, aesthetically, uh whatnot, to to see where the designs of the G-Shock watches come from. Because it's very futuristic and modern, but inherently Japanese in my opinion. And they just really couldn't understand the idea of like, w- what do you mean you want to know where the designs come from? Like, you know, like show me stuff you like. Is it like anime? Is it you is know? It the, is, it, is it the Mudmaster? Which one are we talking about? The Frogman. This is their diving one. This is one of the Sapphire Crystal, like super hardcore construction, a di- like automatic uh, depth gauge. Where is it? Which one is it? Frog- the GWF dash D one thousand. GWF dash D one thousand. This is it. one of the best made G-Shocks. It's huge as well. I see GWG. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and just send you a link. I got here. it. I got it. I got it. Do you have D1000? D1000. Yes. All right, so. Okay. This thing is like hardcore. Now this does like I said, this design came from somewhere. What's the price on this thing? It's like, um, it's about thousand bucks. Okay, so it's coming out pretty soon. It's just it's a it's a crazy cool watch. Um, and I just want to know where the design comes from. Yes, a lot of it is is borrowed from you know older designs. How it uh, you know they carry over these design elements, but for the most part, I want to know what inspires these people. I think it's interesting to me, and I thought that would be something to be cool to do while I was there. That's basically what I'm saying. They couldn't quite figure that out. Maybe they will by the time I get there. Yeah, and I don't think they will. Uh, that's that's. Well, I mean, that's the other issue. They, they they don't. I remember I remember a couple of years ago when they when they suddenly got like all the all the I don't know rappers and musicians and everybody were into like were into G cat G shocks. Oh, like remember when that? Eminem was, like, was into it. Yeah, there was like a, there was like a whole period, and they had no idea what was going on, and they were like they were like high and hiring like Snoop Lion or whatever to come like I don't know sit on a G shock or something like that. Uh, in Japan, it was like some weird. They had, they had, they just had no idea that how how they to hired and they hired who to sit on a G Shock. I forget I forget what the issue was, but I think they I think they had they were trying to do some advertising around the G Shock line to to capitalize on that, and they couldn't figure it out. Remember they did all those weird like. Well, uh, here's what happened. Weird they started getting no no no. What they they still do that they got popular with an urban audience because. For the money, it was like the coolest watch you can get. So yeah, they started to have all these like musicians and like street artists and you know some athletes wearing G-Shock because like if you're if you're like a skater, like what else can you afford that's going to put up with like you falling over and stuff like that? It's going to be a G-Shock. And then Cassio was like, oh, this community likes us, and they tried to like court them and then make weird colors or whatever they thought was fashionable. That was what it was all about. It was kind of a I call it a mutual thing. I do. I don't know. Why uh, I oughta. This one's cool. This sixty-two hundred dollar one. Which one, Mister G? Mister Mister G. <laughs> no, MRG. Oh. That's what they call. It. Oh, Mister G. I love when they say that to me. It's so charming. Mr. It's G. like Hammertone. Hammertone. Oh, these boys. I just love that. There's this tech watch that. Some of the people buying this watch are going to have no idea how this happened, but this bezel and other parts like the uh, the center links on the bracelet, there's this artisan in Japan who by hand hammers out each one of these. And that's why this right. thing costs 6200 bucks. Because they, they pay Mr. G to, sh- to hammer it out? Well, that's the entire collection because Mr. G is like the highest form of uh, G-Shock. All it right. is the so. highest form. <laughs> so I want to hire wanna... a Japanese artisan to hammer the hell out of my watch. I, I, I will too. So tiny, I want to. Tiny uh, hammer. I want to address. I want to address another point. Uh, we were talking about this earlier. Were we? 
Well, there's massive. We're, we're talking about demand. I'm also talking about uh, watch the 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 watch industry as a whole. We have we haven't talked about this in a while, so we might as well talk about it now, and then we can get it over with, and then we can go back to some what's more on watches. your mind, John. So I'm worried, Ariel, John's that worried. the watch industry is about to die. Wah, wah. So I Wait, think, what so evidence uh, do you have to support this concern? I have a friend who is about to buy, who was thinking really hard. He is, he's, a, he's a guy with money. He was thinking really hard about buying a watch company. A man with money. A man with money. He was, he, he was going to buy a watch company. And he talked, to, he talked to a bunch of people about, about, all the, in, about the watch companies, and he figured out that he could feasibly buy any single, one watch, any single watch company out there. Like any watch company? I would think it would be a little harder to buy a, buy a Patek or a Rolex, but those guys are those guys are having their own issues. But he could buy a Panerai, he could buy he could buy anything. So you're saying that that Panerai from Richemont is for sale? I'm saying that I'm saying that potentially Panerai is for sale, or even Richemont's potentially for sale. Interesting. Yes. Okay, I hear you. Do it. I mean, what 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 would you what would you say about that? You know, that's a good question. I don't know. I've never tried to buy Panerai. Um, <laughs> That's the question, exactly. Uh, as far as I know, you know, Richemont, ha Richemont is the company that buys stuff, not that sells stuff, right? So yeah. if Panerai is one of what I call the uh, the flagship brands at Richemont, right? Because mm -hmm. it's very it's very well known. They may, they may not sell as many watches as Cartier, but I'd say that as a brand, Panerai has a huge cachet behind it. And it was, it's also the, the favorite of Johann Rupert. Yeah. So if that was if they were to sell that brand, that would make them look very bad. Now Richemont is a publicly traded company. And if they start selling off all their a assets, all or any of them, mm -hmm. they have to make a really good excuse to their shareholders why that's a good idea to sell off a flagship brand. People are going to think that they're in some some type of a uh, safety mode or, you know, reorganization mode or something like that, and it's going to utterly screw with their share price and not in a good way because mm -hmm. as far as everyone knows, Panerai is doing fine, whether or not that might be true. Now, Panerai has a great design, but they suffer from a lot of the issues that exist within some of the Richemont brands is that they're stuck, right? Yep. They're not allowed to, to really, um, I, could, I would say, evolve. They're stuck within a few designs. They do make you know, their own movements or, most of their own, or a lot of their own movements, and, which is interesting. But that's really the only area where you see anything new. For the most part, there's a lot of recycling or just minor tweaks to make you know new models and or limited editions. So mm -hmm. they're in a bit of a funk, especially since to maintain sales and growth, they've just had to jack up prices, right? Because it's not like the world is buying um, you know, more Panerai. And arguably, like many other brands, they overproduced like crazy the last few years. So that if you if a consumer wants to buy a Panerai, like if you or I want to buy a Panerai, we have no reason to go into a store and pay full retail because there's so much stuff available that's brand new that's not full retail. Yeah. So why would we go and spend full retail? So the Panerai boutiques, as well as the um, third-party authorized dealers, aren't experiencing sales because there's so much unsold inventory on the gray market and otherwise that people like you and I are, are buying when we're interested in buying a Panerai product. So that's uh -huh. essentially the problem that they've got themselves into. They overpriced themselves because of the huge margins involved in today's distribution. And those same margins allowed for uh, a crazy culture of, of, of discounting. So any self-respecting consumer like you or I, even if we like a brand, we're never going to spend full retail because it would be foolish of us to do so. So what's the so what's the solution? The solution is that brands need to think long and hard about their model, and they have to make some short-term sacrifices in order to have long-term stability. So the first thing they need to do is cut their production to only what they can actually sell. What they were doing is they were producing the amount of watches they believe they could sell into the market, meaning mm -hmm. selling to retailers and stores. But that's different than what's called sell-through, which is the amount of watches that go to end consumers like you or me. So they really only need to produce as many watches as people want to actually buy. Two, they have to change their distribution. They should focus mostly on selling direct, either online in their brand boutiques, and they should have some third-party retailers out there, but they should dramatically cut the, the margin. No retailer should be earning 30 to 50% margin on a watch, meaning if they yeah, exactly. sell a $10,000 watch, there's, there's a potential of up to $5,000 in, in margin. Now, that's just simply too much because the, the, the retailers don't really do that much work anymore. It used to be that they did. That's why those margins made sense. And 
that huge margin allows them to discount like crazy. So they could sell. So if they buy a watch at 50 cents on the dollar, they can sell it for 60 cents on the dollar and potentially st still make or 40 cents or they could, they could sell it and make a small margin to a, to a, 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 a third party distributed gray market. So for example, they buy a, a $10,000 watch for $5,000. They can sell it for $6,000, make a thousand dollars profit and that that third party distributor can now sell a watch for uh, $6,500 or $7,000 and still make a margin. And that's still a $3,000 discount than the retail price. It's too mm -hmm. easy to do that. So brands need to lower their retail prices a lot to create less of a sales margin because those, those fat margins allow for too much funny business. And so that's fat what I think needs to happen. Fat margins allow for too much funny business. Fat margins, everyone, allow for too much funny business. Now, I'll buy that. Yeah, so that's, that's what needs to happen. Lower production, lo lower, um, lower margins. And again, in the short term, that hurts a lot of people because they freak out. They sell less watches. Because again, if a watch brand sells a watch at $5,000 wholesale, that still includes their profit, right? So as long as they're selling those watches um, wholesale they are still making enough money. So if they, spend, if they, if they sell 10,000 watches wholesale um, and those watches are being sold at $7,000 or $10,000, at the end of the day, they may not care. Because again, they're still selling their watches at $5,000 and making the profit that they need. The yeah. problem is they're reducing what's called brand equity a little bit year by year because, no, because people, they train consumers not to spend retail. So they have to, so they have to in the short term, reduce sales Go in, go into a negative cash flow for a while, only to reform the image of the brand, so they can bring down prices and theoretically increase sales while selling direct. <laughs> um, and, they, and and some of the third party retailers that exist are just going to have to live on a lower margin. Oh, those! So you're you're a funny guy. What I I basically solved it's the problem. It's never going to happen. You understand this? Okay, I'm just saying that's a, that's a solution. I haven't heard better ones yet. So I'm really worried about the industry. Straight up. Okay, but the thing is this. Demand for watches is still very high. Okay. And that's what people seem to forget sometimes, is that even though it may look doom and gloom for these retailers, at the end of the day, people are still purchasing a large amount of watches. They're just not doing it from the official way. So I would argue that while, while it looks very bad for the industry, demand for watches is high and people are buying watches, except they're not buying through the official channels, so it's not really being... Um, measured in terms of the overall success it's it, it, it's it's sort of off it's a different type of measurement right because you buy gray market um it, it's not it's not something that that the brand sort of counts so to say or they're not a, or they're simply not able to measure it all right so what would you well, do what would you do john i don't know i think you literally had a you had a great you had a uh, you had a great answer that's basically it yeah um but again that means and and here's the thing a brand like Panerai could do it because they have Richemont as a backer. So they would have to say, here's our three to five year plan. We're going to lose money for three, four years. But the plan is that this is successful. We'll end up selling more because the brand will reform. Prices will go down. We'll be able to match consumer expectations. There's still a high demand for this product. And the only barrier to sale we have is the, is the glut of watches on the gray market. Um, as well as the the overall price, which appears high given the, given the average uh, discounting that you see, so they yeah. have too much inventory and too much discounted inventory, and they remove that because listen, at the end of the day, Panera is a successful product. It's not for everyone, but it's definitely designed that people no, it's, like. No, it's it, it's it's a successful. I'm not I'm not saying it's not successful. You'd I'm rock a saying, Panera. I'd rock the I'd, right Panera. I'd, I'd I'd rock Panera every day. Mm. Anyway. So what else we got going on? I think we're we haven't gonna, talked like, about this Casio. Actually, we just went on a big tangent. <laughs> Casio. Okay, so here's the thing. Do you feel like you had to wait a long time for a Casio smartwatch? No, I don't. I don't want a Casio smartwatch. Why? Oh, do you still hate smartwatches? Yeah. Uh, so this is the WSD F F10, right? What this is this? This is called? the first Android. That's it. The WSD F10. This is the first Android Wear powered um, Casio. I like it. It's big. Um, and it suffers from some of the issues that all Android Wear based smartwatches have. Mm -hmm. But I think overall it was a great first attempt. And, you know, one of the things it includes is um, Casio's quote unquote triple sensor, right? Yeah. So it has the built in uh, barometer slash altimeter uh, compass um, that a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of their 
their ProTrek models have, right? So it doesn't rely on the phone, for example, for the compass. It's built into the watch. So if you're somewhere where there's like you know no reception, you still have these basic tools like you would have. It's got a great duplex LCD screen, so you have a very legible always-on state, which is super important to me. Um, I hate I hate watches where see there's the always on state on the screen here so like that's legible that's not like a camera mm-hmm. trick that's easy to see and for me the biggest weakness that smartwatches have and actually the biggest weakness of the Apple Watch which is otherwise a product that I quite like is the fact that the screen is off most of the time now obviously yeah. there's a good battery life reason for that but it kind of makes the watch soulless and while this is by no means the most exciting screen in the world. Um, on this Casio WSDF10, it's something. It has the time, it has the date, um, and it's there all the time. And, and the battery life ain't that bad. So for yeah, me, I don't, I don't, I don't mind that at all. Like yeah. I'm not, I'm not. Uh, I haven't, I haven't worn the, uh, I haven't worn the Apple Watch in a while. Actually, I wore it yesterday. That that doesn't sound like a while. That sounds like it yesterday. Was, oh, whatever. I, I, that, it, that was that was after a long time. That was long after a long period. Okay. I mean, I, I, listen, I'm like you. If I didn't have any other watches to wear, I'd wear my Apple Watch yeah, almost so. all the time. But I got all yeah. kinds of stuff to wear. I got all kinds of stuff, tough guy. So what do you think <sighs> about this? You think that there's a future in this type of product? I think there is. I think I think this is the I think this is the way forward. I think this is what all but everybody's gonna wear. That's the that's the biggest problem. They they even got a tool button on here for me. Mm, push tool. <laughs> Press for tool. <laughs> Press for tool. So the, the see I I I'm I'm in the I'm in the middle of like a smart smartwatch I I can't I don't know what the next what the next You're having is. a smartwatch existential crisis, aren't you? No, it is an existential crisis cuz look think about it. A smartwatch is what? A smartwatch is is everything that you want on your wrist. It's got it's got a pedometer, it's got all the weird stuff that you want to make to make inf- inform you of your world, right? I mean um, theoretically. Theoretically, theoretically. Apple Watch does that too. They got notifications. They make you happy with notifications, et cetera, et cetera. I like when I get told to stand up while I'm driving in the car. Yeah, yeah. you got to stand up or you're in a They really got to fix stand that. Up. Um, you can't have a smart watch that does dumb things like that, like tell you to stand up while you're in the car. Anyways, go on. Yeah. Um, but then you got then you got something like this, which is I think is going to be the future. But the problem is the battery life. You just can't you can't handle this battery life. It's it's too it's how how long how long did this last per se? Um. You know, it's difficult to say because I never like wore it until it died, right? Like I'll yeah. wear it out for a day, I'll go hiking, and it won't die while I'm wearing it. So I've never had a smartwatch die on me, but anyone that knows me knows I'm obsessive about charging things. Yeah. Um, I'm obsessive. Phones, whatever it is, everything has to be charged all the time. So I'm not the type of person that lets things die. But with that said, you know, if this is supposed to be like a hiking outdoors watch and you want to do things like camp or worry about something that lasts for more than 24 hours... You know, you're basically screwed with a product like this, right? Especially, there's like all kinds of cool features. Like, there's a little map you can have on there. There's a cool app that gives you like a weather radar, complete with like satellite imagery. Like, all that stuff has got to suck battery life. Um, also, I think that one of the issues is, and 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 Android Wear does it to an extent, but I don't think it's done as well as possible. Is connect uh, independently, um, you know, to to uh, connectivity signals, so like Wi-Fi or 4G or whatnot. Um, mm-hmm. Android Wear, unlike the Apple Watch, will connect to Wi-Fi depending on the device, but um, it's okay. It's not, the great, it's not the greatest experience, and it's kind of confusing when it is and isn't attached to Wi-Fi. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a lot of strides to make. What I think is, the, is, is more likely to happen than, than not in the future before increased battery life is fast charging. If we had something that lasts the same yeah, amount of time as this today, really quickly, yeah. yeah, yeah, and here's the problem. This is this is great. I have a picture here of the watch with the charging cable. It's a small magnetic cable, right? Mm-hmm. Almost every single smartwatch I have suffers from the same problem, which boggles my mind, and that is that in order to charge it properly, it has to like sit quietly on a stationary <laughs> surface. Exactly. You okay, do it overnight. You got to do it overnight. You got to rub it gently. If I'm on the go in the car hiking or something like that i want a way of like securely attaching my watch to a a charging mechanism where i can throw it in a bag or whatever and it'll charge there's no way you could do this in the bag this makes no sense Mm -hmm. right so yes you can you can attach the watch to like a a, you know a usb charging uh, battery like a portable one but still you have to like i don't know what i need like a rubber band or something to make sure it works together like Give me a way of being able to charge on the go. These are supposed to be 
outdoors watches or a- activity ones. Like, don't make this like a phone where it can only charge if I'm, I'm at home or something like that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, even phones are better for charging on the go. This is this is embarrassingly bad. And, and, by, and Casio is by no means the only one doing this. I've seen all kinds of terrible solutions. Sometimes you have like a little dock that the watch sticks into. Yeah, but a little dock. It could just as easily fall off. And the Apple dock, it's like a little weighted thing. You know, it's like a little weighted brick. The thing weighs about a pound, pound and a half. Nobody wants to stick that in their bag, Mm -hmm. you know? So it'd have a clip or something like that that attaches to the watch so you can stick it in your bag and it'll charge in 30 minutes or maybe an hour max. In fact, I th- I believe the future is Sorry, allowing I would, you. I would I would I would wear I would wear an extra band <laughs> that I could just attach next to it to to charge it while it's while it's on my wrist. Maybe that's an option as well. I mean, I think there I needs mean, to be something where, you know, when we walk, we move our arms, we move our legs. There's an amazing amount of kinetic energy going on, which is being wasted. What if we had little springs in our shoes that allowed us to charge while we're walking? Okay, I know people have had, had those ideas, but it makes sense. What if we what if we ran the watch on blood? We what ran the we watch, ran on, the blood. watch on blood. So be, it would be a vampiric watch. Vampiric watch. We already talked about this. That would be the, Did we? Be the best. Yeah. Maybe that's the good yeah. April Fool's thing. Yeah. Vampire, Vampire watch. watch. All right. So we're. This is about forty-one minutes in. This is our third episode of the new of the new happy. Well, we've happy done episodes. we've done a few of them. So this is this would actually be four. Actually. Um, Don't get all confused. So not every show is with John, as much as I want you to be on every single episode. No, uh, every show is going to be on me. I'm every, always going to be. Well, here's the thing. What I'm, try- what I'm trying to do with the show is make sure that every single show, there's two hosts and only two hosts. I don't want there to be like four or five voices. I think that's too much. But it doesn't always need to be the same two people. Right? So I'd mm-hmm. like to make it in the future. It's you and maybe someone else. As long as it's two interesting people. So anyone in the audience have uh, want want to participate with John? Now is your chance to <laughs> enter the contest of Speak with John. Yep. You can you can ask John whatever you want. You can say to John whatever you want. You don't necessarily have to expect him to respond to you in a polite manner. That is not a guarantee <laughs> of the contest. But now is your chance to speak to John. You can speak to him directly. You won't meet John. That's in the future. We'll see I, about you, that. Why, why don't we Why don't we have a meet John? Why don't we have a meet John? I like to call it Touch John Biggs. Touch, touch, touch John Biggs. Touch John Biggs. Hashtag Touch John Biggs. Yeah, I think so. If you can think of the best way and place to touch John Biggs, he'll be there. To be, to be, to be your friend. To be, to touch and potentially be touched by John Biggs. All right, friends. <laughs> this has been the Our Time Podcast. I'm John Biggs. And I'm Ariel Adams, and we'll see you next time.